Hey everyone, I recently had the pleasure to sit down with one of the uh, foremost gold experts, Alistair McLeod, and a good uh, colleague and investment expert of mine, James Brighting, to discuss the topic of uh, gold and, and, and why there are so many structural tailwinds now, maybe more than ever. And um, I really enjoyed sitting down with them. It was a pleasure and an honor to be able to discuss the topic, which is so current and, and, and topical right now for many investment professionals um, and uh, also self-directed investors at home. Unfortunately, when we first edited the podcast interview, we encountered some editing issues with the software we used, and so it made the audio and visual quality not as good as we'd like. I'm pleased to announce that we've re-edited it, and we are putting it back up again uh, right now, so it's going to be a, a wonderful listen to. Now, when you listen to this uh, interview, there are some really thought-provoking and crucial points that are being made by uh, Alistair and questions asked by James that I think uh, are not being discussed mainstream. And so uh, without any further ado, please uh, go ahead and watch the podcast. Hey everybody, Serge Berger here. Welcome back for another podcast. This is a very special episode because I'm doing this in conjunction with a good friend uh, of mine, James from uh, Nissan's Capital based out of Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, James, how are you? Great. Great to be here, Serge. Great to have you here. This is the first time in the office. He's, I think, already met our friend up there. Um, we are going to be talking about gold today. This is a topic that I have continuously uh, talked to our uh, our distribution, our client list for, gosh, years and years and becoming more and more convinced of it in this current uh, juncture or this juncture, at this, I should say, about nine, nine-ish months ago for various factors I'm sure we might be able to touch on. And um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Alistair McLeod. He uh, is a an absolute expert on the topic, which is why I'm so happy to have him here. He is... Um, Let's see here. It's it, the credentials are long and awesome. He is the uh, the author of all sorts of research pieces. He's an evangelist on on the whole topic, and uh, also the head of research at Gold Money Inc. Um, Alistair, welcome to the podcast. That's very much my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. So I guess we'll just start off with a very simple and obvious open volley. How do you see the gold market here? What's going on in your mind? Well, I think the first thing, uh, which um, the first point I must make is that it's not so much gold rising as paper currencies losing their purchasing power. And I think that's a very important point to understand. And this is particularly understood by foreigners, if I can, if I can sort of, you know, put everybody in that category who actually does understand this. And I'm particularly referring to Asians, Chinese um, maybe even some Indians um, who actually realize that gold is real money to them anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, the paper is just something transient. So, um, you know, it's, it's the fiat currency is going down. That's the background to to what we're seeing. And it's actually it's actually getting quite serious. I mean, the, the thing that's so interesting is that um, People in the Western Alliance, which if I can call them that, you know, let, let's, let's call it the currency alliance, you know, dollars, euros, sterling, yen, whatever. They don't understand this at all. The moment they do, then according to economic theory, basically the currencies are dead. They've had it. <laughs> so so that's, that's the, the, the journey, the end of the journey in which we have started. But the people who do understand this, of course, are foreigners, because foreigners um, either own or are being asked to own paper currencies, which are not currencies which they use day to day. They are someone else's credit, in effect. And so they take a very different view of these things. And what we're seeing, I mean, I think the People's Bank of China is a very good example. Um, what the People's Bank of China have been doing is they've been selling dollars. But what do they sell the dollars for? Other currencies? Well, no, the dollar is the top currency. They sell it for real money, which is gold. And so, it, you know, when you grasp the concept that actually what the Bank of China is doing is selling dollars, not 
buy, you know, not buying gold as such, the emphasis being on selling dollar, then you understand what's driving the the gold market. And so, Alice, it goes Alice, a quick, just a yeah. quick question. Do, do you think, I mean, I, of course, the central bank buying of gold has been a big element in this this, this um, yeah. sort of rise of interest over the last uh, nine months. How much of that do you think is a is a function of the fact that the Americans have chosen to weaponize, let's say, capital markets um, vis-a-vis, for example, Russia, versus a sort of flaw in the fiat currency yeah. argument that uh, you've been very good at um, describing? Yeah, James, it's definitely a trigger. Let's put it that way. I mean, it's woken up quite a few people. Um, I I wouldn't say it's woken up people in the central banks as such, because I think central banks have taken this view that um, the dollar is less useful than it has been. Um, it is being sold by foreigners generally. And if you look at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS Plus and all the rest of it, you can see that um, it, the policy basically is to do away with dollars as much as possible. So. Um, this is something which, from the central bank's point of view, they need to adjust their reserves to take account of this. So they are selling dollars, they're selling euros, and they are buying gold. Um, but, you know, if you're a central banker in a foreign central bank, yes, I mean, you look at this and you think, um, you know, what they've done with Russia, well, it's not nothing, that's not anything terribly new. The Americans behave like this anyway. Um, but it does, re you know, reinforce the point that, the dollar can be used as a weapon, uh, as an economic weapon, and is and the Americans have no hesitation in doing so if the circumstances permit. Uh, and um, for anyone thinking of joining BRICS, you know they one of the threats that they face is um, American provocation. Um, uh, you know whether it's it's weaponizing the dollar or by engineering a coup d'état, which apparently the Americans do. I'm not making any accusations. You can see that. Uh, this is, um, uh, yeah, I mean, all these factors feed into it, but, you know, it boils down to the same thing. Yeah, you know, they don't want dollars. I mean, it's not that so much, and this is, this is the point I'm trying to make. It's not so much they're buying gold. They're trying to get out of dollars. They're trying to get out of anything that is related to dollars, which basically is the whole of the fiat currency um, system. And Is, um, is there any evidence that... Um... This behavioral pattern is being mimicked by, say, other central banks like Japan or the Middle East. You, is there no, evidence, evidence to describe any evidence to support that yet, or do you? And do you anticipate maybe that taking hold? Well, this is the fascinating thing because um, you know the point about the the Western alliance is the Western alliance, um, you know, which is sort of embraced wholeheartedly. Uh, that the dollar has replaced gold entirely, and gold is now just a pet rock. I mean, they all, they've all bought into this. If you talk to, you know, just look at the policies of the Bank of Japan. They are thoroughly Keynesian in their approach. Um, you know, they don't realize what is actually happening to their own currencies. They don't see the danger. It's just like the people who are last to understand it are the people who actually use the currencies for day-to-day -day transactions. They will eventually wake up to what the foreigners have already woken up to and already decided that they don't want to have a part of. I mean, so um, I think our central banks are yet to go on to that journey. Now, having said that, um, the few central bankers that I've talked to, um, they don't dismiss my argument. I think it causes them pause for thought, but I don't think they've got to the point where they really begin to understand it. Because apart from anything else, from their point of view, it's a horrific conclusion. It really is. Um, I, you know, it means, and, and particularly for America, uh, the Americans, um, uh, in, so far as I can see, do not have the gold which uh, they claim to have. Now, I think the evidence of this we saw in their treatment of Germany when Germany wanted a small part of her gold repatriated. Uh, and not only that, but if you go back to um, uh, the last uh, century, um, you know, when when gold was used, if you like, um, uh, in, you know, as a, uh, it was leased, as it were, as part of the 
um, as, as an arrangement whereby you could you could lease gold at one and a half, two percent and then sell it into the market uh, and go and buy um, six months treasuries at uh, T-bills rather at something like six percent, seven percent, eight percent yield. I mean, we're going back into the mid 80s and into the early 90s. Um, so that carry trade, that was the original carry trade. And of course, um, this gold disappeared. And as a, an, an analyst called Frank Veneroso put it in, in Lima in the year 2002, he'd done a lot of research on this, on this uh, um, gold leasing thing. He reckoned up to 10 to 15,000 tons of this gold had been leased out from central banks and had disappeared, effectively being worn, as he put it, by around the necks, uh, you know, as ornamentation of Asian ladies. So, um, you know, there is this huge, great hole in uh, central bank numbers, gold holdings. And looking at it, I can only conclude that that big hole is actually in the US holdings. The US holdings, not only of its own gold, but also the earmarked gold held on behalf of other central banks. So um, I think the whole of our system is just doesn't understand this at all. And also, if you talk to people, members of the of the London Bullion Market Association, um, the people who um, uh, are on the short side in COMEX, um, they don't really realize this either because they've made their living out of trading something um, which, you know, wasn't really going up in value or it might go up in value, but it would come down in value. They could manipulate it. But this is now changing. This is the whole thing. And if, if I can just um, give you another example of where this is really going, um, look at it from the point of view of the Chinese savers. Now, Chinese savers fully uh, amount to something like 35% of G of China's GDP. I'm talking about household savers. These are the individuals, if you like. Now, that's the equivalent of $6 trillion. Now, where does it go? It's no longer going into property. The stock market is not attractive. Yeah, the stock market's not attractive. Um, and uh, uh, they can't put it into anything abroad, really. So what do they do? I mean, at the moment, it's all on bank deposit. But the banks do offer, and this was something which uh, was promoted by uh, the government, they instructed the banks in effect to do this, uh, to offer gold accounts. So if you've got a minimum of say five or 600 yuan, you can open a gold account at your bank so that you can have some of your money say on deposit and some of your money uh, invested in gold. Now, if I can just sort of say, without all those alternatives, I mean, the property markets had it and so on and so forth, we're looking at the equivalent of 75 trillion tons of gold in savings every year. Now, obviously, I wouldn't say that. I mean, for a start, there isn't 75,000 tons of gold available uh, for uh, this to meet anything, you know, any sort of demand like that. But um, you can see that the pressure for investing in gold and also silver, incidentally, uh, just from um, Chinese citizens is really ramping up. And um, I think... So, so really, you're saying it's a Chinese tsunami at both the retail and the central banking level, which will be driving absolutely, demand. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I was, I, you know, in preparation for this discussion, I, I looked at um, you know, net inflows, outflows of ETFs, you know, the sort of Western capital markets, and... I was actually surprised that despite net outflows, I mean, we've had 11 quarters of outflows up until May. Mm. Now, for the last two months, we've had inflows, so it seems like it's turning. But but this price rise that we experienced over the last seven, eight months has been really, despite the fact that there's been oh, yeah. net outflows of, of ETFs, does that, does that surprise you? Or does, just to give you a sense of what... <laughs> How much demand must be compensating for these um, for these negative forces? Yeah, well, you know, when when I sort of think it through in terms of this sort of you know foreign in, foreign uh, uh, approach to investment or uh, uh, credit risk and domestic uh, views of credit risk, and then transfer that onto the sort of Western alliance versus the the huge great Asian hegemon block and all the rest of it, we can find. I mean, you know, the three of us. Um, are experienced in financial markets and in investment. Okay, this sort of behavior we're getting in ETFs is the sort of behavior you get at the bottom 
of uh, of a bear market. Um, you know, this is this is the last gasp, basically. You know, the the the, um, the unwashed public basically selling out, having lost loads and loads of dosh. But here we are seeing exactly the same phenomenon, right? Uh, you know, when prices are going into new highs. At some stage, this sentiment is going to turn round, and it'll turn round when people begin to realise that perhaps it's not prices of goods and services rising, but perhaps my money's going down. You know, by money I mean credit. You know, the currency. And uh, the moment they start latching onto that, they begin to understand a little bit about why gold and silver are rising. And also, of course, they will be attracted by the only bull market in town because part of the whole scenario which is evolving is that if you've got people in uh, the Asian block, as it were, turning sellers of US treasuries, then the yield curve is going to go sharply positive and goodness knows what sort of level of yield uh, the US government is going to be financing its deficit, which incidentally will be considerably larger than uh, the Congressional Budget Office tells us. So, um, you know, if you put all these things together, you can see that the market shifts are going to be very, very remarkable. I mean, higher bond yields means nasty bear market in equities. It means there's going to be a rotation out of anything which they've made money in so far which will suddenly turn quite sharply into loss making, into uh, mines, minerals, um, you know, oils, whatever, whatever, you know, or the whole of the mining complex is suddenly going to get terribly interesting. And there's not a lot of stock around. I mean, you've got a few leading companies, which obviously the investment management industry can buy quite easily because they don't have to think about it too hard. But where are the analysts? You know, where's 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 the information? I, you, you know, this is going to be a, it's going to be a fascinating shift. And I think anyone who um, is late in that one is going to rather regret it. Um, well, it's interesting, Alistair, you know, like you, 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 this is a timing question now. I was just watching a uh, popular financial television station the other day and uh, the lead analyst was 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 talking about how how at some point they're going to really quickly change all their portfolios. And we're talking about many hundreds of billions of dollars, not just, I, I just couldn't help but laugh. It's not gonna happen. Let me just quickly give people a little bit of graphics here. Um, first of all, I mean, I think that point that uh, Alistair made here about, uh, it's not so much, uh, in this case, China, let's say buying gold, but the really selling dollars. I think that's right there. That's a great headline. Um, also just a little bit of, uh, of, of visuals here. I brought along a few charts. Um, what we're looking at here is a long-term chart of the gold futures market. You can label this spot. It doesn't matter. It goes back to the, to just a couple of years before I was born. So it's been around for a while. And, um, essentially what we're seeing, this is a logarithmic chart. Uh, you can essentially see, you know, gold had that big run that I, I certainly remember up to, uh, 2011 and then basically did, did nothing, uh, for a long time and has now started to break out. This is where we now have this performance year to date. Uh, I just brought along the popular SPY, S&P 500 tracker, essentially uh, gold actually was outperforming the, sp the, the, the SPY up until a few days ago. And then of course, Apple and Nvidia is doing things again. Um, last point I want to just quickly make, which I thought is fascinating, you just mentioned gold is behaving right now like it would at some sort of you know horrible bear market in risk assets. At the same time, where risk assets, at least a few of them, are basically going parabolic. So I just find that really fascinating. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on this, but it's to me, it's all kind of lopsided, at least for a while. It's completely lopsided. And I mean, you know, also, if you look at the bond markets, that's very lopsided. I, you know, the, the, the markets are basically broken. I mean, we're facing an election in this country, which is going to elect um, a left wing socialist government which um, will be high spending. You know, this is not going to be a surprise for anyone. Yet as far as the markets are concerned, the yield in the gilt market on the 10 year gilts is lower than on US treasuries. Now, hold on, the, the, you know, the risk default, default in, in, in global bond markets is US treasuries. Why are we yielding less than US treasuries when plainly sterling is going to collapse on this election, I, you know, <laughs> this is, it's, it, it's a complete nonsense. Um, and 
uh, it's not just not just there. I mean, if you look at some of the yields in around the eurozone, I mean, there's a complete distortion when uh, you look at, uh, say, um, you know, Greek bonds, um, Italian bonds, the yields there. I mean, they they're less than U.S. Treasuries in some cases. This is, you know, this is this is just um, bizarre. Is a, is a short answer, and that that is something that at some stage will correct. And when it does correct, I think it will be because the markets just go snap. Um, the markets will come back and and uh, uh, drive pricing. And uh, in that context, I think the idea that the central banks actually have control over interest rates—you can forget it. That's <laughs> that's that's not going to happen. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure that they're already. You know there are central bankers worrying about this one way or the other, but um, you know that everything seems to me to be totally mispriced. It is absolutely crazy. So I get the um, the central bank and the, the, the China tsunami argument. I get the flawed fiat currency argument, which are, by the way, extremely strong arguments. But just to sort of play devil's advocate. Um, you know, if, if we do have inflation sort of being tamed, which, which people seem to say it is, and let's say we have higher for longer, so we have higher real rates than we've had historically, those are, I mean, historically, those are not great conditions for gold to outperform. So, you know, what do you, what do you say to those devil, devil's advocates? And I'll bring up the, uh, the real rate here. I'm just taking 10 year treasuries. It's, uh, I think this is the constant maturity one subtracting uh 10 year break evens so that'll give us that real rate <laughs> well um the origin of inflation is basically um uh government money printing um more so than bank credit i mean bank credit misdirected is inflationary as well um and by that i mean bank credit which is expanded to uh finance consumption as opposed to production that is inflationary um the Biden administration and Mr. Trump's administration, when he becomes president, if, if that's what happens, um, it's going to be no different. They're going to be running larger and larger budget deficits. And so far, we haven't even um, taken any account uh, for an economy which is probably, um, I mean, it's certainly underperforming and it is probably going to be in the throes of a collapse um, if certain things happen. Now, uh, under those circumstances, you will get rising prices. And um, the mistake which um, analysts tend to make is they think that rising prices uh, require uh, increasing demand. No, it doesn't. What it requires, basically, is a falling value purchasing power of the currency. That is what is happening. The extra money that's going into the economy, the extra credit that's going into the economy is purely um, being produced by the government uh, for non-productive means and uh, also to the, by the banking industry in the sense that um, uh, it is allowing uh, savings, if you like, to diminish by increasing credit card debt and, you know, all these sort of various means of, uh, of, of, of uh, financing consumption without savings. So this inflation problem is not going to go away. This is a situation which is rather like the 1970s in that sense. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that the debt trap, which uh, is part and parcel of this problem, uh, is going to drive up uh, bond yields on the long end, as I uh, referred to earlier, and it'll drive it up. I mean, we had this situation in the UK back in, in 70, uh, what was it 1976, uh, when we had to call in the IMF basically to rescue the situation. At uh, that time, um, the government was forced to issue um, uh, medium and long term bonds, I think 15 year maturity bonds with coupons of 15 percent and more. Now, imagine what that does to, um, you know, a, a, yeah. a debt to GDP in, in the U.S., government debt to GDP of 130 uh, percent. Well, maybe you know, this is this is a very in nice the 70s. Debt. Just, just to have a look at that. No, I, I think it's interesting. We're just looking at the gold price back in the 70s during that um, interest rate and miscarriage period that you mentioned that. It just went hyperbolic. Yeah, so I, this this goes back to 1975, so a year before you mentioned Alistair. But uh, we did have, a, from that point, a 
90, we can round it up to 400% increase um, in, yeah. in that period. There is another aspect of this, which, um, you know, the, the current crop of uh, investment managers seem to be totally unaware of. They're sort of informed by the carry trade thing where, um, you know, there was the relationship between uh, the cost of borrowing gold and uh, the return that you could get putting those proceeds into into T-bills. <laughs> Um, meant that there was a relationship, if you like, developing between the yield on gold and the yield on T-bills. And if the yield on T-bills went, uh, you know, sort of went up relative to gold, it would increase the selling of gold, basically, to increase the carry trade. But actually, if you go back to that period in the 70s and look at um, the relationship between um, uh, the gold price and um, uh, the Fed funds rate or the prime rate, you will see, I mean, with that, that decade started with gold around about $35 an ounce. <clears throat> it was officially there anyway. And uh, the Fed funds rate was running at about six and a quarter percent. And it did subsequently go down to three and change. But, you know, at the end of that decade, we ended up with gold at $850 an ounce. And, um, you sort of, you know, 19% uh, Fed funds rate. So, you know, actually, in normal times, there is a strong correlation between rising interest rates and a rising gold price. And the reason for this is very, very simple. The reason that interest rates have to rise is because the um, expected uh, um, uh, fall, if you like, in the purchasing power of the dollar is reflected in increased interest rates. And of course, it's exactly the same thing which drives the gold price. So you can see that actually the correlation should be one to one. And indeed, it was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting that in the last few months, when gold has been running up into new high ground, or as I would put it, the dollar has been going down against gold, uh, you've seen that relation begin to creep back in. And I think this is this should be noted as a pretty good warning of um, what's going to come. And this is the chart that, uh, just to quickly clarify this in case, uh, in case anyone doesn't uh isn't aware of this, what we're referring to here is that at least for a few decades now been what has been somewhat of an inverse correlation between uh, between the price of gold and real interest rates. Real, real, real rates are your, your nominal rates, let's say the 10-year treasury, and you subtract, let's say, uh, the, the CPI, consumer price index, and this, this can take a break even in forward inflation rates, whatever, same deal. And what Alistair is saying here is that actually longer term, that correlation is actually positive. Um, yeah unless I'm totally <laughs> butchering this, but I think that's what we're saying. And it's actually quite important because uh, these historical, you know, one simple thing I always tell our, our, our clients about is if you look at the average age in Wall Street, it's, uh, it's currently somewhere around 36, 37. Um, this current bull market in risk assets is about 15 years old. So you take, let's say, a 37, subtract so 15, you get to about 22. Um, what do people do at 22? They graduate university, right? So basically, most people are mostly, if not experienced, what a bear market and maybe what some of these correlations look like. So they're all looking at the, you know, I was walking around. It's a, interesting. A, a, yeah, I agree. I was walking a, around a conference in, in Fort Lauderdale the other day. And, uh, you know, if you go to the, the, the convention booths, <laughs> I was picking up all these brochures of, you know, the ETFs I can understand, but mutual funds, others, every single one of them went back exactly 14 years in track record. Not one of them went more. <laughs> Enough to erase memories. <laughs> Enough to erase memories, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just another anomaly, just Alistair, you're, it doesn't seem like, you know, miners have not behaved very well, um, and which suggests that the market doesn't seem to, to believe that gold prices will last. And, um, I mean, as so far as I'm, I, I can see, they, they look incredibly cheap, the miners. So I just wanted to get your take on, gold miners and whether that could be a way to play this. Yeah, no, I, uh, James, I agree. I mean, it, 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 it comes back to this bit of, um, you know, the, the market psychology. I mean, in Western capital markets, um, you know, we're still selling gold because we don't, you know, we're behaving like, like idiot children at the bottom of a bear market still, you know. Mm -hmm. And the same obviously applies to the analysis of, uh, of, of, and waiting, if you like, in portfolios of gold mines. Mm. Um, and, you know, as I pointed out earlier, you know, that there is also the, the additional problem that nobody's analyzing the sector. I mean, it's, you know, 
Who wants to get involved with mining? It's dirty. It's not ESG compliant. I mean, you know, you've got all these things you can throw at it, and it's so much but, easier. Well, did this, did, did, I mean, this is a variation of Serge's point because if you've had what fifteen years of just <laughs> awful markets, yeah. I mean, who's, who's left in the sector? I mean, if exactly. are, 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 is there talent in the mining sector? Is is there talent in the analyst sector? I mean, it seems to be 15 years of, of pretty, pretty terrible markets so will pretty yeah, well, much cleanse everything. I know. I mean, <laughs> does that make years, sense? I think the, the analysts have retired. I mean, you're still there. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are actually, to be fair, there are one or two pretty good guys out there who mm. know what they're doing. Um, who are your favorites? Make, but where yeah. they make their money, I mean, I'm yeah. thinking about people like Rick Rule and so on. I mean, where, yeah. where they make their money, I think, yeah. is, um, you know, they know the managements. They understand the geology. And they've been at this game for the last, I don't know, in Rick's case, I think, good 30, 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> and they know their way <laughs> right, you know. And, but, you know, anyone else, I mean, forget it. They just don't understand it. They don't yeah. know it. It's mm. not their game. Mm. And the other thing is, of course, you know, you're not getting the, um, you know, the big deposits being being uh, found anymore. Uh, These are, you know, it's all sort which of- Which is good for the price, of course. Yeah. 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 But there will be, I mean, the other thing, talking about the sort of market psychology, the bottom of a market, you always find that as the market begins to recover, M&A mm. activity picks up, and I would expect that to become a real feature in the coming months. I really would. So maybe that's a sign that we're on the cusp of something, is what you're I saying. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. But of course, I mean, there's quite a lot of technical uh, uh, stuff. I mean, when you you know when when you look at people who instead of chasing value are sort of chasing momentum. There will come a point, I suppose, where you know the momentum boys will start mm. start getting excited by the sector. So oh. you know, when it turns around, it could be quite quick. Um, but Do you have a? I mean, how would you how would you recommend investors to play the sector? Do you have um, you know sort of some sort of suggestions on you know, between ETFs and physical and miners and royalty companies? You have. Yeah. Well, what well, are your I, thoughts on that? Yeah. And 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 what to, to what percent of the NAV should people be thinking? Um, yeah, well, I, the first thing I should say is that I'm no longer in the business of giving investment advice. So, yeah. so you know, the, just take this as a generalized opinion. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, my experience in the past has been that the first things that will move are the big boys, you know, the big mining conglomerates, simply because any fund manager can buy that. And if it goes wrong, he's not going to get sacked. I mean, if he goes for the real esoteric, mm. uh, you know, exploration stuff or, you know, junior mine, <laughs> whatever, whatever, you know, that goes wrong. He's in trouble. <laughs> so, 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 you know, that, that I think is the, is the first thing to note. But um, you will find, I think, quite quickly that um, as things develop, some of the smarter boys will begin to start analyzing these things. You'll find that they will start looking for, for prospects which are next to established mines where, you know, they could be takeover prospects for the established, you know, miner mm -hmm. next door sort of thing, all this sort of stuff. Um, so I think within the sector, there's going to be quite a lot of developing speculation. Um, but generally, I just look at that psychology. I mean, we know that the psychology is extremely negative at the moment. Um, I mean, people will tell me, and I'm sure they tell you that, you know, the costs of mining are rising the whole time. Energy costs, because it's all energy intensive, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's going up. Um, uh, you know, the cost of permissions, you've got political risk. I mean, there's every reason not to buy it. But that will gradually be overcome. And I think that um, once it gets moving, I think it could actually move quite quickly because it is the mm. other side of the disinvestment of the things that are falling in the mainstream stocks. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, now, mentioning, yeah. mentioning ETFs, um, I think I would say that the difference between holding bullion and holding an ETF is a bullion, bullion is, is owning money, full stop. Owning uh, shares in an ETF is actually owning credit, not owning bullion. That's a very, very important distinction. Yeah. Mm. Um, the way I see currencies developing, personally, I would not hold ETFs. I would actually go for the bullion 
and coin. You know, I mean, right. if, if we're to, if we're talking about pra practicalities, um, you know, have some coin as well as bullion stored safely in a proper vault, not held in a bank account or anything like that. Right. You know, even if the bank, if the bank says, okay, we've got it earmarked for you, it's your stuff. You know, the banking system actually uh, can turn around and you will suddenly find that there is confusion over actual ownership. I've seen this before. So stay outside the banking system with your bullion. But, um, uh, you know, when it comes to investment, which was really what we were talking about before, um, then ETFs are an investment. They are not an escape from credit. You do also have that problem with mines in a sense in that um, any equity is actually a form of credit because what are you buying? You, you're buying an income stream. You know, there's a promise mm. of an income stream. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that in itself is credit. And then there is the other problem, um, which is that um, we don't actually have certificated shares anymore, or at least, I mean, you can get it, but you have to insist on it and pay for it. You know, we have rights of entitlement, which basically means we don't actually have, um, if you like, that credit. We've got an extra layer of credit, as it were, between uh, the, the mining company and ourselves. Mm. And this is the the system, the, you know, the DTCs or whatever, you know, the, the system which is, issues the entitlement, but actually physically holds the stock. Now, why I is see. this happening? You know, this is happening because, um, you know, the, the exchanges have uh, absolutely no um, capital to deal with a real problem in the markets. If you get ma ma multiple counterparty failures, um, then the exchanges go belly up. I mean, it's mm. as simple as that. So the way in which this is dealt with is they will take everybody's shares on which they've got a certificate of entitlement and use it to protect the system. I'm absolutely clear in my own mind that that is why we have this, you know, euro clear and we have the, you know, the, the, the DTC system in, in America and so on and so forth. You know, we don't own the shares anymore. We just have an entitlement. Why? Because they're going to need that collateral in the event of an overall collapse. So I would just say, you know, this is another distinction between an investment ETF or a mine and actually physically owning bullion. What, what percent of the miners are selling their gold forward? I, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking through if, if, uh, they, ha yeah. if, they, if they haven't done that, then you know, probably the, the next few <laughs> quarters should show some pretty robust profits because the, the the increased price in gold will go right to the bottom yeah. line no so what's, what's your thinking on that well, you, yeah sold it forward for paper credit <laughs> sold real money for paper credit well no well, but if, they, I, if, they, if the gold price was at whatever eighteen hundred dollars and they sold it forward at eighteen hundred they haven't benefited in the in the, in the price yeah. increase well and I, whereas if yeah. they haven't sold it forward they could they could they, you know it would just show up as revenue and yeah. profits on their well, I can tell you, I can tell you, James, that if you if you look at COMEX, which is the only, I mean, you know, we get the CTFCs, CFTCs figures, um, then we can see that uh, the level of of hedging by producers is actually almost at an all time low, which is fascinating. I mean, they're well, less than fifty thousand contracts, something like forty, thirty seven, forty thousand contracts. Yeah, but that speaks and, well for miners, then. It well, it does. It does. Yeah. Um, I, I think part of the reason for this is that from a mine manager's point of view, he is primarily interested in the cash flow because he's got, you know, he's got to buy the, the energy, he's got to do service equipment, he's got to pay for miners and so on. Um, so he's primarily interested in cash flow. Now, when prices were lower, uh, this basically meant that he would be inclined to sell um, uh, production forward for a premium uh, so that he would have that cash flow guaranteed. So that's easy to understand. If you go back to uh, 2011 12, when gold peaked um, after the great financial crisis at around about $1,900, the level of hedging at that stage was over 200,000 contracts on COMEX, which is, is interesting because compare that with today. The other category which takes the short side on COMEX are the swaps. And the swaps are comprised mostly 
of bullion bank trading desks. And they're the guys who basically will supply the ever optimistic <laughs> bulls uh, with paper contracts, um, futures contracts. Uh, and uh, they are now bearing most of this themselves. And this, I think, if we get a further rise in, in the value of gold measured in declining dollars, this actually could uh, uh, lead to an enormous problem within the bullion, bullion banking community. I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, a number of these banks uh, getting themselves into severe difficulties. Interesting. Well, at the end of the day, what we're really talking about here is, is, is an asset class, if you want to call it that, that has kind of been out of favor to some extent. And, 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 and what you're thinking is that maybe at some point it'll come much more into favor, uh, maybe for forced reasons. For a little bit of context, you know, we talked about, you know, there being very few gold analysts left or maybe very few good ones. Um, you know, right now the energy market, this is just kind of give people some, some, some perspective on this. The energy market, if you look at the S&P 500, is currently about, it's not even 4% of the S&P. Uh, if you could just go back, I just took a, a couple of decades here from the 90s, 2006, it really averaged closer to like 10%. So that's like, you know, two, two and a half times that. So, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, extrapolate here that things can change dramatically. Uh, conversely, technology has historically actually averaged closer to like a 15% you know, of an S&P, whereas currently we're, if you, if you do the actual math, that's probably closer to 45, 50, if you jumble it all together. So anyway, just thought I'd quickly, I'd quickly point this out as a, as a side note. Um, I think we've, we've gone through a lot here and at, at, at the risk of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of myself getting a headache, cause it's so much to, 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 uh, to comprehend here. Are there any last, um, thoughts, questions from you, James? And of course, from our guest, Alistair? I, th I think we've covered the bases and I think I found it very fascinating and thank you, Alistair, for your, your contributions, your wisdom. And, um, I certainly learned a lot. So well, very great, very, very grateful. Yeah. Very, very much my pleasure. I mean, I, you know, we're in the business of educating people. Um, I mean, this is why you're doing this, this podcast, isn't it? So, mm. so, um, you know, and this is also my mission you know, my self-appointed mission in life, uh, which is why I've set up a sub stack because, um, you know, gold money is, 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 is great, but it's very much angled at, um, you know, if you like the wealthy or people who actually have savings, which to, to, to put into, uh, gold bullion. Um, but there is a far wider audience out there which needs to be informed of, um, these momentous things which are happening. Uh, and um, how it will affect the uh, risk to the value of credit. Uh, we're already beginning to see this, and we see the fo foreigners voting with their feet, um, uh, driving um, uh, cre our credit values down because they're abandoning it. I mean, this is really what you know the, the, the Chinese situation is all about. Uh, so and uh, these I, I, I have one, maybe one question I was thinking about yeah. was just the whole the convergence or the potential sort of substitution of crypto versus gold do you do you see people buying because quite a lot of the arguments that you, you you suggest are also kind of shared by this crypto market and i'm i'm just wondering yeah. whether whether you think that could either detract from your argument or maybe capitulate and and go towards your argument uh that well crypto and, and gold or silver are two completely different things I mean, for a start, gold and silver are legally in common law, virtually everywhere, money, whereas cryptos are not. So crypto doesn't have that status. Mm. But there is a more practical problem to consider as well. Uh, the, the first is that the role of um, gold and silver as money is to allow the value of credit to be attached to it. We, I mean, you know, in a practical modern economy, we don't spend gold and silver. We actually... Uh, deal in the credit which is attached by value to gold and silver. So the gold and silver don't circulate. I mean, that just, you know, that's somewhere else. But as long as we have, as long as we can exchange credit for gold and silver, then it is, you know, then, then it works. It's stable. Um, and so the role of gold and silver, well, particularly gold, let's just concentrate on gold, 
is to be uh, constant in its purchasing power. You do not get that. Sorry, let me just shut the door for a minute. Um, you do not get uh, that constancy out of a cryptocurrency mm. like Bitcoin, mm. which is designed to be so limited in its um, uh, quantity that its value should always rise. I mean, this is if it is if it is used as a basis for credit. Now, um, if you have the value of credit, which attached to something like Bitcoin, which rises and rises and rises, then no businessman can actually make any um, investment plans, which basically means putting out down uh, uh, money or credit now uh, in order to produce a profit later. I mean, you know, the investment up front, if you find that, you, you know, you just can't calculate uh, because the value of the uh, you know, of the repayment of your capital, which you've borrowed, uh, say, it's in exorbitant, five, yeah. 10 years, it's just right. through the roof. So mm. in other words, it is totally impractical. Mm -hmm. um, there is, James, also another problem, I think, with cryptocurrencies, and that is um, a purely legal one uh, in the sense of possession. Um, uh, if you if if let us say someone steals a painting off the wall of your house, and um, it ends up uh, in the possession of someone else, you can claim it back. And not only that, but you don't have to pay any compensation at all, even though the person who acquired it didn't know it was stolen and also probably bought it through, through um, a, you know, a reputable auction house. This indeed is what the Jewish families have been doing, recovering uh, stolen uh, property uh, by mm. the Nazis. So, mm. you know, that is quite clear. But the situation with money is completely different. Money is completely fungible. Now, if someone steals your wallet and goes and spends the money in the local shop, you can't go into the local shop and say, Oi, that's my money. I want it back. Mm. You can't do that. Unless, of course, you can establish that the shopkeeper was in on the robbery. So um, there is this fundamental difference. Now, in the case of Bitcoin, each individual bit of Bitcoin is identified by a blockchain. So this gives a right of possession to each individual bit of Bitcoin, as it were. The blockchain is the thing that makes it more like a work of art than it does of money in this purely technical sense. What this allows is uh, any authority who is chasing, let us say, the proceeds of crime, money laundering, or tax evasion and uh, mm -hmm. feels that they have got a case um, uh, to recover a certain identified bit of Bitcoin, when they come knocking on your door, you're not going to get any compensation. This is a very, very important point. So um, I would say that these cryptocurrencies are um, speculation and no more than that. I mean, I can understand the mathematics behind it. We can all understand that. But at the end of the day, if I'm right and the very existence of credit is threatened, then Bitcoin will disappear with it. Excellent. That'll open up a whole nother discussion, maybe another time. Uh, again, very much appreciated, Alistair. One last very important question for you. You mentioned your Substack. Where can people find you? And, and if, you, if it's a too long a link, you can just let me know and we will, of course, share it with people. Yep. It's um, I, basically you either Google McLeod Finance Substack or Alistair McLeod dot Substack. Mind you, the spelling of my name is sort of quite Scottish, so you might have to have a couple of cracks of that. <laughs> we'll get it. We'll get it straightened out. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Thank, Thank you, James, for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alistair. My pleasure. And very nice to see you again, James. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for contributing. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye.